Hi, this is Sarah Linton for BWB TV, and I'm here with Chris Jamitti, VP of Operations for Sentian. Hi, Chris. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Perfect. So, Sentian's developing Allo MSC products. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on at the moment and the, and the types of stuff you guys are doing? Sure. Uh, so, as you mentioned, we at Sentian are developing uh, allogeneic MSCs. Uh, for a broad range of severe systemic inflammatory conditions, such as acute kidney injury or AKI. So unlike some other approaches that deliver allogeneic MSCs intravenously and bring those cells to the blood, uh -huh. we actually load our cells into a hollow fiber dialysis-like device. So our cells sit on the outside of these hollow fibers and the patient's blood perfuses through the inside of these hollow fibers. Okay. So in this way, they remain shielded from the immune system, they remain encapsulated in this device, but they can still sense and respond to the patient's own blood. So as opposed to bringing cells to the blood, we bring the blood to the cells. Okay, and at the moment, the whole industry is sort of exploding around CAR T. Sure. Um, but where do you see the future of MSC sort of going? Yeah, so MSCs have taken some time to really get their feet underneath them as it relates to the clinical mechanism of action. We have a much better understanding of that now, uh, which has actually allowed the manufacturing and many of the operations to catch up. So I think MSCs are really poised to um, um, reach their clinical and commercial potential. And MSCs have a very complex mechanism of action. And as such, they can treat a, a complex uh, disease state, such as acute kidney injury, which is where Sentin is. Okay, cool. So that sort of leads me on to my next question then. In terms of working with MSCs, what would you say are the main advantages? And then I guess on the flip side, the main disadvantages? Yeah, so I think probably the main advantage of using MSCs is their broad mechanism of action. They secrete a wide range of cytokines, growth factors, yep. EVs, and they're dynamically sen uh, sensing. So um, that's probably their greatest strength, but at the same time could potentially be their greatest weakness as well. Um, they can, there's a lot of characterization to do, complex analytical techniques, but even past that, they're um, well characterized clinically, uh, they've been shown to scale commercially, and generally um, shown to be safe. So I think uh, they're poised to really um, deliver on their commercial and clinical promise. Okay. And then sort of away from that, yesterday obviously you sat on our panel, our yep. CDMO panel, looking yep. at insourcing versus outsourcing. Yep. What would you say, I suppose, were the key takeaways from that panel? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, whether you are outsourcing your development or keeping it in-house, you have to be the expert in your process. Your team has to really understand the critical process parameters, the critical quality attributes. That depth of understanding is really the foundation off which you can build. So when you have that knowledge, you can bring things in and keep it yourself. And I think that's the greatest amount of control that you can have. Or you can outsource it to a, a CMO. And I think, uh, especially with the early stage companies, yep. outsourcing makes a lot of sense. You take advantage of all of the things that a great CMO offers you, infrastructure, analytics, quality systems, mm -hmm. and most importantly, skilled people. Okay. Um, and so you've been in the industry for 20 years, which for those working in cell and gene therapy knows actually yeah. is actually quite a long career in a space yeah. that hasn't been around for so long. Um, with your experience in the industry, I suppose, what would you say, in your opinion, have been the top three milestones to date? Yeah, so certainly I think there's a lot um, in the 80s and 90s in terms of scientific breakthroughs. Uh, but over the last 10, 20 years, I think um, it was actually maybe even a, a, a negative milestone. <laughs> uh, and that was the dot-com bubble bursting in the early 2000s. I think a lot of those early tissue engineering regenerative medicine companies um, were more like research institutes than real businesses. Okay. And so I think through survival of the fittest, we really reorient reoriented ourselves um, to push these forward as a, as a business and make sure they're uh, commercially viable. So that's one big one. Okay. Uh, the second is probably the 21st Century Cures Act. Uh, not only did that uh, establish the RMAT designation, but also yeah. uh, put forward a lot of money for the FDA to resource a lot of technologies coming through. And I think the third, generally speaking, are the CAR-T and gene therapy approvals, yeah. uh, whether it's Yaskarta, Kimraya, um, that can show that we can have truly transformative therapies 
that have a significant difference over standard of care and can be scalable and very attractive in which to invest, but also be commercially viable okay. as well. What would you say are the biggest hurdles when it comes to getting, I guess, like Gis Carter, et cetera, yeah. to the patients? Yeah, so ultimately it has to work. It has to work scientifically and clinically. And I know that sounds simple, but I think for a long time in cell therapy, yeah. we have products that were maybe incrementally better than standard of care. These are really transformative in gene therapies as well that may even be curative. Mm -hmm. So I think once you can establish that, and that really comes from a deep understanding of the science and how these things work clinically, if you can do that, then um, you know the process may take some time, uh, the approval may take some time, but I think ultimately we'll get there. And we're seeing now that there are still challenges of patient access and reimbursement, yeah. and those are real. Um, but we are still early days with these transformative therapies, and I'm confident we'll get there. And I guess that's why it's key things like outsourcing and your cost of goods and your critical quality to your tributes. Those will drive down what could potentially be the cost of the medicine to then make it more accessible to patients. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and certainly patient access and being able to um, deliver these to, to patients, yeah. payers, hospitals that make sense across the entire spectrum is really key and something we're seeing evolve in front of us right now. Okay. And then I guess my last question is obviously we're in Boston and Boston is this huge biotech hub it um, and it's amazing for new science and especially in cell and gene therapy yeah. and you're Massachusetts based too. Yes. So what do you think it is about Boston that makes yeah. it such a hub and makes it such a sort of cool, exciting place with regards to science and what's going on? Yeah, it really is amazing. And I think you can point to this convergence of some of the key pillars of innovation. Uh -huh. We have some of the top universities in yeah. the world uh, that are producing smart people that want to stay here and continue to innovate. We have some of the top uh, hospitals that are doing not only their own research, but clinical research as well. Mm -hmm. You have investment groups that are VCs, but also strategic partners, um, as well as the companies themselves. You bring all of that together, as well as the state, the government has done a lot in terms of incentive and overall support. You bring all of that together and you have a really amazing ecosystem. Cool, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. It was my pleasure, thanks for having me. No worries.